Hello and welcome to the latest madaxman.com Army List ADLG podcast in which I'm joined by Richard and Dave and we dive into a matched pair of historical armies this time in another new experiment for this format. This time we're looking at the Hundred Years War, an army in which the English and French effectively came to be as nations but really it's about Cressy, it's about Agincourt, it's about Poitiers and it's about a load of other smaller battles that weren't recorded and it's about English longbowmen and French chivalry. Two famous lists, two maybe not so popular lists, want there on the table, but we're going to hopefully show you how. So sit back and enjoy the podcast. This means war. This means war. Well, welcome to yet another um, list special from madaxman.com i'm joined here as usual for these list specials by richard and dave hello everybody good morning good morning good morning you almost waved there richard that doesn't really work podcast wise but um but we're we're getting better at this Uh, we're struggling towards it it's all good and um and in our trot through the the popular but under underachieving maybe um lists of the world or or lists of the um adlg army list book or, or booklet section this time we're actually looking at two lists in parallel which are are something of a matched pair and um and actually mark quite a important part in military history and an important part in political history in in the structure of europe and that's really the period of the hundred years war um and the more specifically the english list and the, the french list it's you know it's a legendary war it's got the the great battles of Cressy and Poitiers and Agincourt it's got Joan of Arc it's it's got the move from from a sort of yeoman soldiery and chivalry into into more professional armies it's got the foundation of of two countries really Uh, but from a war gaming point of view it's got longbowmen and um, they're usually so cool that most sets of rules make up a special troop type for them and uh, and I think that's kind of one of the the interesting questions as well but um, you know other than that it is by definition, a hundred years, um, or more than a hundred years, if you look at the the dateline, and it, it is famous for certainly from the English side, um, three battles. But given, I believe the French ended up winning. Um, I suspect there's some other battles that the French won, um, the English lost that that we don't get talked so much about over here. But um, and then there's kind of peripheral people around the edges. There's the Low Countries. There's the Burgundians. There's the Scots as well, who all kind of drift in and out and our our secondary characters on this this particular stage and uh, and that is all set against that backdrop of of military evolution but um i don't know so over to you guys what you know, looking into these lists is this a period that you'd you were surprised about how much depth there was in it was it one that you knew quite a bit before about or, or, or what have you been surprised about fi- digging into the background of these lists I think one of the the interesting, just sort of looking at the history, it's it's quite interesting to see, as you said, it's it's the real crystallization perhaps of English and French nationalism and the shift with, from essentially feudal armies to professional paid armies uh, for the first time in a thousand years. Um, so so that's quite a shift, as you say, the rise of infantry versus the knights that are dominated in the sort of 11th to 13th centuries, both the long bowmen and by the end of the period, the rise of pikemen uh, is beginning to come through, um, both in the low countries, Switzerland and, and to a degree Germany. Um, so, so it does point, uh, mark some very significant social, national and military changes And as always, war uh, forces that. But also we have to remember that in the middle of the war, we had a catastrophic plague in the form of the Black Death, which also, I think, had some fairly major impacts on on society and the outcome of the war. Yeah, and and I think picking out one thing from that, the the longbow, which I mentioned in my my preamble, in an era that if you go back you know you can see how the knight evolves from chivalry and and they're just kind of good and effective and but before that you know the the norman period and the, the early part of the medieval period it seemed to be 
knights versus lines of slightly subpar spear people um and and then the longbow kind of appears as the the uber weapon to to change it now to what extent you know we all have these stories of, of skeletons from the mary rose with with a huge one of their arms much bigger than the other and things like that coming up so how did how did this weapon so seemingly sort of spring from nowhere and then become the preeminent weapon and then then i guess to an extent fade away um to to some degree after after this where where did it just come from to to become a completely almost new weapon class that works well certainly wargaming terms a new weapon class so it emerges in uh, in wales particularly south wales from from what we can see and it's adopted by the anglo-norman um barons in that area see its benefit and begin to use it so it's used in the Clare's invasion of Ireland for example and it and it's particularly picked up by Edward the first um, who faces it when he's facing the Welsh but then uses it in his armies against uh, the Scots and his reign is really a reign of transition um, and you see it in in the sort of uh, the late feudal English lists where you still have a lot of mounted knights but you're using them with longbow and then the the shift in the, the sort of 1320s is that armor tends to shift from essentially chain mail with a bit of plate reinforcing to you begin to see the emergence of full plate mail and the English start to fight predominantly on foot. The English knights and men at arms start to fight on foot. And we see the emergence then of the, the English military system that persists for the next hundred or so years and is eventually copied by the Scots and, to a, and elements of it are adopted by the French. So one of their tactics against the longbow is to dismount and the rules reflect that, you know, uh, a foot knight is much more resistant to longbow fire um, than a mounted heavy knight. And as long as it doesn't, it's in open country, the foot knight will, will normally beat the longbowman. But in broken ground, and the English were usually fortunate or careful enough to have the battlefields include muddy fields or other broken ground, the knight's too slow and the firepower tends to, tends to overwhelm them. Not necessarily directly, but what the longbow tends to do historically is it pushes the knights into column and they then head for the English men at arms on fairly equal terms. But the flanks of those columns are then chipped away at by the longbow, um, eventually leading to, to French exhaustion and, and collapse. Uh, we see that in a, in a number of the battles. It's a, I suppose it's an interesting question in terms of, you know, you talk about Edward adopting this and, and rolling it out. And, and then at some point by, um, is it Shakespearean times? You know, everybody's training to be a longbowman instead of playing football or something, something slightly surreal. Like yeah, that. there are a laws passed to that effect. And I think what that also, you mentioned Shakespeare, it's quite interesting. We see um, through time, you know, in the early part of the war, you might have one or two men at arms for each longbowman uh, and a lot of actual knights are still fighting in the armies of Edward III by the time we get to Henry V and later we're seeing the ratio shift to maybe one man at arms to four and later even eight uh, longbowmen so a real shift and that's partly expense, you know, the, the, the knights, I think, were paid three or four times what the longbowmen were paid. We get more men at arms who were paid as squires at half the rate of a knight. Um, and the actual term for archers in the payroll is, is, is often valet, you know, servant. So perhaps that also shows us, you know, the evolution of um, some of the longbowmen were coming from the personal retinue of, of, of the knights. Uh, but I think because of that, because of the cost, we, we see a much greater adoption of these yeomen. And that's paralleled by the rise in Flanders of the pikemen. And so a real shift in pride. So it's the, it's the quote unquote lower orders who are doing a lot of the fighting. And so their sense of pride, and I think that's partly why they're able to resist 
the mounted knights better is that they have confidence in themselves and so are more steadfast. The reason a lot of the earlier medieval spear isn't so good is that when threatened by charging knights, the sheer rumble of the ground and their lack of confidence means they often actually broke before contact. Um, whereas we, we see the shift in psychology uh, as part of the broader social changes. And that's also connected to the Black Death uh, because that increases the wages of the poor. Right, just by um, by stripping out a number of people from the landscape. There's by the competition, speaking. yes. So lords by had, everyone had to pay more to get work done. Right, okay. Because I, I think it's... So Sorry, Dave, you don't chip in about the Black Death? Um, no, the Black Death and serfdom to some extent. <clears throat> you, you know, you get the lack of serfs. It, that changes the whole social order of the countries. You know, uh, I think that's very true. I think the other, I mean, I think Rich has covered that very completely. Um, you've got two different systems creating in parallel, haven't you? You've got the English taking the longbow. The Scots take up the spear, the pike as well. It's the low countries and those are peasant what these are peasant weapons and you know the, you're, you're moving what was, you, what was, you, that, what you, was you, not happening then in what was not happening in france for them to still stay much more uh you know a mounted nobility was that was that cultural was that was that black death related thing it didn't touch france quite as as hard as it did here because it's certainly the the textbook view of these battles is is the english you know trained peasant soldiery with their longbows um you know, raining down down death on posh french knights who were too too posh to get off their horses initially um you know, were they just behind on it was it the longbow it just was lucky that it was in wales or was there a cultural I'll, I'll shift that was that going with, on as well i'll chip in on that that there was this i mean from what i know from what i did from medieval there was a big notion of chivalry in france greater than in brit in england probably so they, they, you know, their military, their militarism was based around the concept of chivalry. So their fighting was done by the knights. And I just think they had more knights to uh, call on. And, and the English army, which, you, you know, you, I think we said this earlier, that you're talking at the beginning of this, you're talking about a civil war between two French states, in effect, going to war, which is, you know, the English knights and the English aristocracy spoke French. And they were fighting over their what the English nobility saw as their rights to have land in France. So what begins as a civil war gradually changes, probably as you're saying, through the Black Death to some extent, and through the change of warfare. And these are raids conducted by semi-professional army. Cressy, there, there may be a force in the English to think you know at, just before Cressy they're they're almost starving to death in northern France they're trying to march across the landscape to escape the, the French army and they've lost their horses they've lost a lot of their um, equipment and they're forced back on this new method of, and they they kind of discover this new method of way of warfare by accident yeah because that, that, I think that's another interesting point it's it's 100 or it's 120 years or so and and we know of these three battles and, and as I'm sure there are, are what famous battles if if we'd gone to school in France about when the French win at the end but but there's only three of these set piece battles in this hundred years war that, that are the famous three but the lists then I guess do you feel these lists are written for those three battles or do they cover all of these presumably smaller raiding actions and you know great great marches around um around France by by bands of of English people um, pillaging the countryside do you think the lists are, are geared just towards the three battles or or do they actually work at a much smaller scale to to recreate some of these other mixed arms forces i think they're more aimed at the large battles i mean adlg is a large battle set it isn't trying to model the, those smaller wars and a lot of those words you say were raids and sieges um that's where a lot of medieval um, battle strategy would or war strategy would revolve on is, is the taking of cities the the control of, of provinces i do think and again you know there's uh, there's if you were actually trying to recreate one of the specific battles you could do it from the lists but as i've mentioned earlier probably you have a bit too much freedom um 
in in the list uh you know earlier phases the ratios maybe should be different to later but at the end of the day the the list writer while they're trying to capture the essence of the period has also got to give um you know when you've only got 20 to 30 units, units. you've got yep. to allow some freedom um in in order to put down a, a, a playable four so i think that i think the list the lists are good but you would want to tweak them a bit if you were actually you know trying to do the order of battle for a specific event that, that's well documented so maybe then it's one of those lists like the those couple of early roman ones where it could almost do with an advisory note to say you know if, if you want to recreate the english army of Cressy, Pratier, Agincourt, you should have a ratio of, of two to one, four to one, yeah. something like that, yes. possibly. But, um, but you know, the trouble that that's got everybody into with the confusion on those early Roman lists, maybe it's maybe it's best it's left off, really. Otherwise, we'd all be answering questions online about it from people for years Well, it, would, it has to be, when, when it's advisory or informational, it needs to be clearly marked as that rather than prescriptive. Because otherwise... Yeah. It, I think it, it in, in the case of those Roman lists, maybe it just needs to be better translated, um, because I, I understand the French list actually says this is an advisory. Um, okay. It was just a translation error. War. Okay. Well, look, as, as we're on talking on the lists, um, what we've what we've decided to do this week is to really look at we've we've chipped in with an English list each and a French list each to cover this this almost a matched pair um, of armies and um, and let's start with Dave um, I think we've got your English list which I'll just pop up on screen here now um, for and this is an English list in 1340 um, there's obviously a reason for choosing that specific date um, Aha, it's um it's the Low Countries. You snuck in a Low Countries ally now. Now, I guess well talk us through how this list works and um and remind us why the Low Countries were involved um, as well. I guess I, I I'll leave Richard to explain the Low Countries you know, participation. Um, what I've tried to do with this list is um the first mission was to get a large enough army. I mean, there's some very expensive troop types and foot knights and longbowmen. Um, I've managed to get 23 into the army, which and I that's, think is that's big. Achievable. That's very big for a late late medieval army, definitely. Yeah. And the, the main way of doing that was to use the low countries ally because you've got a few trooper troops. But overall, you've got three commands. I've tried to go for balance here. Um, I've got one command which has got a good amount of medium foot, light foot to hold terrain. One command which has got a, a knight component to fight in the open and support the pike. And the pike, the low country ally, which will go chomping down the centre of the table, we hope. Um, obviously, because it's allied, you want it in the centre to give it more chance of activating if it throws a one. And so the low countries ally list, it, part of the component is as I say, it's trying to be quite cheap. So I've got four pikemen mediocre who've got it's two great like, value troop type, really yeah, great value troop really, type. Yep. I mean, the Scots army in this period is a fantastic list. You know, that's a, a shocker that is. Um, because they're mediocre, you need the two light foot bowmen to protect them. I'd love to have more in actual fact, but I think that's a difficulty. Um, they're there just to protect those guys from shooting. Yeah. You've got to have a foot knight in that low country ally. So I've made him the general. So I guess he'll sit in the center of that group. Um, a foot knight general is a very good piece. He's, he's a very, very powerful piece. I mean, he will probably be the one who does the damage in there. Um, I fought about it with Tommy Warden in from Ireland once. And I think I had to hit a foot, a foot knight general from all four sides before I killed it. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, really difficult. So that's the centre of the army. Command one has got the four longbow, and it's also got two B-Day light infantry javelin elite. So I almost hope that I, I you know, I might want to get a piece of rough, uh, difficult terrain there. Shove those two B-Days, bidets in there to hold that piece of 
difficult terrain. I mean, light infantry javelin with being elite is a very, very powerful force. You know, they will hold up a piece of difficult going, if not hold it entirely. Um, I probably tend to try, you know, if I have a field, I tend to put the four longbowmen together in a field, yeah, maybe. Four is, four is a big number because in your, you know, almost every other list you've coughed up so far for, for here, you've put two bowmen in together. But here you've gone four. Is there a... Uh, is there a magic number with two or three or four? Is is four much better than three? Um, yeah, does the shooting scale up somehow? Do you feel? I think shooting becomes very very powerful. Um, I tend to use two bowmen to support cavalry, ca support knights, and things like that. You know, to add the shoot to shoot their way in. You know, if, if there's a piece of terrain of the right. I mean, if you had a if you had a hill with a field on it, you are not going to shift four long bowmen off that hill. And no, it, not a long bow, anyway. Yeah, yeah. You're going to find it difficult to hit, shift them out of the field. Um, mm. it's, it's that massive amount of firing. The fact that you can slightly edge them, so two long bowmen shoot at one piece. You're going to cause hits. I think you're going to hit three hits out of four most rounds with that lot. And it, you know, you, you get two to three shots as any troop type comes in towards you. There's no medium. There's not very me many medium infantry in this period. So you're not going to get medium infantry, you know, even if medium infantry spear came at you, you're going to shred them with bow fire to make it an even fight and you're elite. Um, yeah, I suppose four is a very wide unit. Most people are going to be putting, if you've got medium foot, they're struggling to put two or three together, really, aren't they? So you are going to be doubling up on the shooting on anything coming at you. And then, then, then the rest of that got, command. Um, then you've got four foot knights, including another knight general, um, four uh, Sorry, three Sorry, foot four. knight, the halberdier, who's damn good. The halberdier can support the longbowmen, but you're going to, you know, you're going to be putting those foot knights down the centre of the table in support of the pikemen. So you're going to be trying to get, you know, those. Okay. Yeah. So you've got four pikemen and the foot knight with the low countries, then you've got another yeah. four foot knights and halberdiers. So you're you're up to nine wide of proper combat stuff, plus exactly. the four longbowmen who are, are winning any terrain battle kind of almost in the Middle Ages in a way, and, unless they come up against those Swiss halberdiers. But um, so that's actually giving you quite a lot of frontage with, with this thing. So what about your um, your third command then? That's much no, more three, um, You need something which is, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm thinking that's the, not, the foot knight's first command is one wing, this is the other wing. It's gonna go down the center of the table. Hopefully the pike are gonna support those three knights impetuous. Um, and they do they, um, do they dismount in this period? I'm trying to think who, what, where but can those um impetuous knights dismount? I imagine as well, if need be. I don't think they're allowed to, they're not, they're not oh, given right. the option. I mean, if they're facing some sort of um, sure. state, okay. they can dismount, you know, that would be okay. great <laughs> if you're facing that. And um, I've done my regular trick there, I've got a long bowman and a crossbowman to support the knights, work on the outside, possibly in assistance with a medium cavalry impact that, that medium cavalry impact can sit behind the bowmen and threaten anything which comes towards them but that the idea there is that the knights included general and the three knights in Petrus go forward and you want to bring those crossbow and the longbow out past them on the wing to start shooting them in and trying to get into the flanks of things um yeah i think it's it's, a, it's quite a flexible army i think there's a lot going in its favour, particularly the numbers. I think that there's definitely an arm. I mean, I've got three included generals just to try and get myself up to 23. There's an arm. Yeah, and they're all ordinary as well, aren't they? Which is remarkably notable, yeah. especially one with heavy knights impetuous. Um, that's quite I, I, figure, I, I figure on being the defender here and, you know, with a with an allied pike, mediocre ally, um, you want to make sure he's moving before anything and if you're defending you get an extra piece of terrain which you hope will help out as well yeah yeah because i suppose you're, you know unless you're fighting in in period you're not going to be seeing that many other other longbowmen so um richard what's what's your thoughts on this one so i think it, it you know like every list pluses and minuses so the pluses are the raw number of troops and you know a lot of very useful troops a, a, a strong fighting line um disadvantages as we've said it, having all the generals as ordinary means and and having no um light horse re, uh, means it's 
the each of the commands has to stay quite tightly grouped. It's very easy if you if the general's on one end of the line, it's very easy for the other end to be out of command range if you want to move it as an individual unit rather than as part of the group. Okay. Two of the commands are potentially unreliable, um, which, as Dave says, if you're on the defensive, isn't the end of the world. Um, <coughs> but it does mean that there's perhaps a danger that the opponent could try and screen off one or two of the commands and concentrate on, on the remaining part. But each bit is strong. So even if they do that, they're not going to have an easy job. And the chances are that they will activate at least one of the commands if it is unreliable by closing in. So, you know, I, I, I think it would be fun to play, um, but I think it would be, you'd have to practice with it a few times or you have to be comfortable fighting with a low amount of command and control. And if they become committed to combat, potentially no command and control. <laughs> control so you are relying on the fighting qualities of the army. So it's about keeping that to be successful with it. It's about keeping the tactics simple, which I think suits this kind of army because it it can stand and shoot or it, it can charge in. Mm. I don't think um, it, yeah, wants actually, fight any, it, it doesn't want to fight any mounted um, bow armies, but then it's got the longbow. I mean, there's an argument you could drop one of the longbows from the first command, and that will give you 11 points to bring, you know, commanders up to competent, stop them being included or unreliable. That's one argument. But then it, it, it is it's what it does on the tin. It's a, it's this period. I've, I've designed it to be representative. So go for yeah. it. Yeah. No, I think it's, yeah. a, it's a good version of that period yeah yeah i suppose if you, know, if you were just tweaking it, if you swapped out one of those four longbowmen for a second crossbowman yeah. you'd save yourself four points which would which would then either make one of your generals competent or not included because i just looking at that i think a, a spectacular total points cost for your generals of minus 15 i think that's, <laughs> that's possibly that's possibly the lowest it's possible to get isn't it i don't think you can do more than that um no minus 15 that, that no, is but yeah. i mean the other, the other argument i would have if you if you're going to use somewhere to drop a base you might want to be looking at raising those four pikemen from mediocre to ordinary and make it even tougher in a fight you know because the low countries ally don't have to be mediocre they can be ordinary i think they're allowed four or something like that whether that actually works in terms of the ally i'm not sure but there's a yeah, if you're allowed four you'd be allowed two wouldn't you you could you could yeah, bump two of them up to um that up to mediocre and um you could probably and end up on the long bowman for another crossbowman yeah i know yeah yeah okay well look, so okay. just a quick comment yeah. on the history yeah. the the reason yeah. the low countries became involved is that the um the english had a a huge bit of their export trade was selling wool to the Flanders cities um, for them to make into cloth. And um, at this, the whole point of the war was who should be the King of France? You know, did, did, did Edward III have a better claim through his mother or, or the French nobles wanted a, what they would regard as a truly French uh, king? So the half brother of the Count of Flanders uh, just got the agreement of Edward III to support him as the true Count. He swore homage to him and a number of the Flemish cities, particularly Ghent and I think Bruges, then used that as an opportunity to legitimately rebel because they could claim they were supporting the true King and the true Count. Um, hence why in this early part of the war, those cities provide allied troops um, to the army and often the the English um, armies were marching between sort of Normandy and Flanders through through northern France got a few of the campaigns do that okay so is this a um one of those allies that was theoretically possible or is, is there record of of um you know low countries citizens participating in in some of these combats um I'm I'm I don't know whether they actually they didn't fight in any of the big battles, but certainly um, they were up, they were in arms in support of the English. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure that they ever fought together. 
but possibly an army like this, which would perhaps, which isn't perhaps a royal English army, but but represents some English nobles with some Flemish troops, uh, is a very plausible army for 1340. I think yeah, we'll AGLP lists are pretty accurate. If, you know, I think there must have been at least one occasion when the English had some low country in there, as they would have the put field. it in there. Yeah. yeah, and it, you know, it's certainly not the king unless um, he's letting himself be an ordinary included general at minus three points. That's, um, <laughs> that's not really doing your, um, your world well, of shadow exactly very, very well, is it? No. Okay. All right. Well, look, that's, that's the first list done. This means war. So look, that's one English list in 1340. And if we um, if we move on, I think looking at it, Richard, I think one of your lists is also 13. No, um, is also 1340. So yeah. um, if I can if I can try and throw that one up on screen, um, let's just get the screen share working properly. And it's 1340. Um, here we go. So you've got 22, another another good number because it's north of 20 for this one. Um, You've also got zero initiative, but you've you've oh you've you've really gone big with a competent general um, on this one. You've got the, the Germans, the medieval Germans, but and, um, and a nine, a five, and an eight. Um, so you know, talk us through this. Which which one would you see going down first, or, or which which command do you want to talk about um, in which order for this one? Well, sort of just sort of working through it. I think probably um, the. I, because the English basically is all foot, I went for the German to give me a mounted impact um, strike command. So the two English commands, uh, the smaller one first is three heavy foot, one of which is included elite knight general and two heavy spearmen supported by two longbowmen. So I would probably deploy that in the centre with the two longbowmen between that command and the German command. All right, so that they can support the support shoot the knights. They can provide support shooting to to the Germans. The idea of taking the spearmen is to just make it tougher against the French mounted. So I think that combination. You know, the spearmen will make the French knights a little more hesitant about just ploughing in. If they do, it increases the survivability of the line and perhaps gives the English um, foot general a, a chance to really grind in on its opponent, assuming he survives the first round. Um, the other English command then, you know, I would be, depending on the terrain, uh, it has a number of longbowmen with a, a crossbowman just to sort of pad out the shooting a bit and if there was a flank field they would go into that otherwise I would probably have them providing the link um, to command two or I might run all the, the heavy foot together it depends on the situation but what you've got there is you know a little bit of rubbish to pad it out but it just gives it means you know, with the medium swordsman, you've got four troops plus a light infantry javelin that can go into rough. That line infantry might just turn the odds. And the idea of the hobble art is probably just to hang around behind the line and plug a hole if one appears. But if the tactical opportunity presents itself, it can swing wide and threaten a flank. Yeah, actually, just, just looking at those brigands, that medium swordsman, um, medium swordsman mediocre, it's a pretty dreadful troop type, but in this micro period, um, it's not like the French get loads of good terrain troops either, is it? That's kind of as good as anything that's going to find in there, really. Well, I've often played Hubert using, he often uses the Hundred Years War French, and he uses this troop type effectively because it's not very good, but when it's facing nothing or it's just <laughs> facing a light infantry um, in the rough, it, it can be quite potent and it can threaten a flank. And the big thing is because everything often costs eight, 11, 14 points, there it is at five. 
it can really help you grow the army into the low twenties instead of having an army of nineteen. Yeah, it make, it, just by existing, it makes the rest of the stuff more survivable because exactly. the army's going to last longer, and, and it, nothing's going to come in there and get it, is it? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, the Germans themselves, then, um, I think I, I picked up on our now sort of fairly standard idea of having some spearmen to support mounted. What I like about this combination is that I would, rather than having the knights on the outside, I'd probably have the crossbowmen on the outside, then the spearmen, then, then the knights, and then the longbow of command two. So you've now got quite a nice mixed line with quite a bit of shooting, um, some sort of durability with the heavy spearmen and some punch with the impact knights. Um, so all in all, quite a, quite, um, quite a mixture of troop types, a reasonable size. Um, yeah, I, I'm not in love with it, but, but out, out, out of what I think is a very challenging list, I feel this is something that I could put down against any opponent and, and, and have a chance. Yeah, that, that German command with a couple of crossbowmen, a couple of spearmen, three heavy knight impacts and a mounted crossbow, that is a proper little all-arms command, isn't it, really? Yes. That, that, does, that does do quite a lot. And then your final command is just the textbook. Um, well, actually, there's more spearmen as well. You, you've gone six spearmen in the army, so it's, it is designed to fight the French when they're all on horses, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, the, the spearmen hold them off and the well, it's really against anybody. The spearmen are there to hold people off and to hang on while the longbow and the knights do the damage. Okay. And then you've got um you've gone for the minimum number of of archers um as well, the English archers, the four. Uh, you, you you padded them out with some crossbowmen. The Germans obviously have to have crossbowmen as as well instead of the, the longbow. Were you tempted to at any point to say you know, is it because the longbow are too expensive? Are they not good enough? Do they not? What, what do they not do? Given they are the the troop type for this army. Well, to me, it's the spirit of the period. I think at this period, the English weren't weren't using that many longbow. That was much more later on. So I thought, well, I'll be in the spirit, and I and I I think they are expensive, and I wanted those impact knights. So I think if you go for the impact knights, you know, if you change a couple of spearmen at eight to elite longbow at 11, I mean, if you could take ordinary longbow at nine, I'd have a few more. But with the choice being 11 or nothing, yeah. I think you've either got to base your army on them or take the minimum, in my view. OK, Dave, what's what's your thought looking at this one? Um, I think I think it's very similar to the list that I've done in the first tranche um, with the going for size you know we both got included generals and the difference is one allied but we're all we say we're trying to save nine points with command there um i think rich is right i think the heavy knight the german ally with the heavy knight impact gives you a bit more control and i do like the idea of the spear um although the spear are slightly at risk if they're facing a foot knight because the foot knight will drop it <laughs> slightly <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah um i think it, it's kind of similar we, we, it's balanced and we you know you've got a bit of mounted you've got bowmen on the outsides it's the balance of it that's the attraction there yeah and what about the um you know the stakes oh no stakes is from 1415 so it doesn't quite fit in this one um as, as a discussion anyway but um they just add more to the cost of a yeah. very expensive yeah. drink type in fact maybe, maybe even as a generic point you know stakes they give the enemy the opportunity to dismount yeah which sort of then neutralizes the longbowman but but could force the enemy to dismount and lose lose maneuverability what's what's your two views on on stakes are they are they worthwhile or is it always too much and, and too little tactical flexibility? I think if you go for a lot of longbowmen, so you don't have the heavy foot to protect them, then I think they're worth taking. Because even if your opponent dismounts, he goes, he's now a heavy foot, but with only three cohesion. And if the longbowman can put a wound 
on the footnight. And they still have a reasonable chance of doing that because the footnights are only advancing at two. So you should get three, maybe four shots at them. If you can put a wound on them at contact, you're zero all. Yep. And, True. you know, the longbowmen are elite. So, and it really, if it's in an open competition, what it ha helps hold off is, is the enemy mounted archers and, uh, and things like that. So uh, to me, it's a choice. If you're going for eight or more, I would go and you're going a longbow dominated army. I, I would take the chance and take them because not everybody brings dismounts. Um, if, if you're going the minimum and you're relying on the heavy foot to protect them, which is a kind of earlier type army, then I wouldn't, you, A, you can't take them, but I wouldn't take yeah. them. I, I completely agree. I think if, if, if you're going long, you know, big on the long bows, you, they're worthwhile. I, I wouldn't bother. I've, I've played with both versions with using French ordnance and things. Um, I think they just tend to make you too static. You've got to keep the longbow close to some other else to protect them and just use their shooting and make them dance if necessary or just accept that they can get run down at some point. It's, is some of that because in this army it's an all or nothing option? So you've got to pay the points to to give everybody stakes or, you know, if you could if you could ch pick and choose and give some units stakes or, or or not, would would maybe you think about it differently? Is, is, is part of that thinking because it's all or nothing? I think there's a, um, to, you know, in, in, the interesting thing with this army is there's a, there's a, an assumption that it's a bit of a static, straightforward, but the way to play with it is to combine troops. You know, here Richard in this list is combined the heavy spear with the foot knights and the bowmen. So if you can go forward with a couple of bowmen and foots, a strong group of foots, that you know, they, they, you're shooting in the foots, or you can go very wide with a lot of archers and use, you know, create a huge amount of firepower. So you've got, you, you can evolve and maneuver this army around by saying that both of us have got three, you know, yeah. two orders of generals and no maneuverability whatsever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, that, that... there's an opportunity to revolve some troops, move forward, shift one, bring the archers around the back. You know, there's, there's, some, there's some interesting ways you can play this army. Yeah, I, I guess those three big battles, those sort of static defensive battles, take so much of of everybody's attention that, that I think the point you made um, earlier on, Dave, that a lot of these were sort of much smaller raiding actions, and there's a lot of small battles in the Hundred Years' War that yeah. this is actually representing, where they they would have been much more, um, you know, mobile or, or whatever. And the fact that the French um, volunteered to charge across the marsh in in the rain into a hail of longbows um three times um it was very gracious of them but um shouldn't necessarily um detract or, or mean that all of the other battles were kind of swept out of the way okay. this means war Well, look, let's um let's move on and look at the the third and, and final english list which is one that i've i've conjured together this one's a bit later um it's a a 1415 um list and you know i've gone with let's use the toys let's use the longbow and let's use the stakes if you're going to have them um if you've got the option of doing it let's let's throw that out there and try and make this longbow first list and i think this is i suppose the question with this one is it's sort of the question I've, I've just asked really is, is this an army that is for doing those big three battles and, and relies on some, some degree of um, participation from the enemy in your plan um, or, or how viable does it stand? But, but what I've gone here is, is that much smaller, the, the, that kind of the lowest limit to which you can probably sensibly do a, um, a medieval army and a 19 um, it's a nine a five and a five um competent and two ordinaries again i've i've gone down the included route um for a couple of the generals and gone with knights on foot as well but this is just all about getting the best quality stuff that you can really and and trying to get the enemy to commit to attack it and and relying on the sheer volume of shooting to see if that works so so my um 
I big command, um, really, you know, which is sort of probably ends up kind of central, but it, it's got the ability to go into terrain. I think with this one, you're trying to scatter terrain all over the table and and have lots of patches of terrain to cause maybe a more one dimensional enemy army, you know, little challenges of how do I deal with that spot there or that bit of rough or that plantation or, or, or whatever that might be in the middle. Um, you really want bits and pieces in the middle to disrupt a big solid line coming at you. Um, so the first command, the big one, the nine, um, you've got the um, the dismounted elite foot knight um, there. That's that's a solid, you can't get better than that. Um, a spearman as well with armor to, to sit next to them. I think there's, you know, you can, um, you can probably armor argue the toss on on armor when you're fighting potentially some heavily armored knights but but for the extra point there's only so much extra you can do with it three elite longbowmen with stakes they can operate with the foot um or the heavy foot or they can with you know operate on their own and actually you stick them out on a wing um and they drop the stakes it is driving off anybody else's cavalry there's a crossbowman who sits with them who can who can support their shooting and you know in theory might be vulnerable but um but next to three of those longbowmen that should be enough to scare them off i again pad it out with the medium swordsman brigand taking that same theory that it's mediocre it's not great but against nothing <laughs> it's pretty good um and a light infantry javelinman to to dance around and do a bit of screening and and again that that medium cavalry impact it's quite a you know the, Going into a flank, I'm a big fan of medium cavalry. In fact, you know, I, I use a lot of Arab armies with the mediocre ones. You're anything that medium cavalry can't take on frontally, you're not taking on frontally. But there's a lot in this command to occupy the enemy. Do they look at the foot knights, the spearmen, the longbowmen? They're dealing with shooting. There's a little bit of stuff in terrain with the medium swordsman. That medium cavalry can kind of sneak around, and you hopefully the enemy forgets it's there. And then it pops up by moving a lot faster than everything else. Um, and it also gives you quite a good edge if you do come up against anybody's medium foot who, who are unwise enough to venture into the open um, and, and trying to chase down your longbowmen. So it's it's a nice little counterpunch to that. The the second command is is just kind of a textbook. This is four longbowmen with stakes and a foot knight included general. Um, he gives it resilience, but you're probably deploying the, the four longbowmen together. You could spin a couple of them off and, and send them off to, to really give you a massive amount of shooting on one flank and, and use it as a three and two. You could even drive it down a flank and and there's not much mounted. It's getting past five longbowmen and a foot knight um, either way. And, and once they pick up the stakes again, they're still moving three. They can get back into the middle quite quickly. The third command is pretty much much the same, a slight, slight difference, basically just shaving a few points off by having effectively the same command, but instead of four longbowmen, it's got three um, and a slightly cheaper crossbowman. Um, really just otherwise it would be 18, which does start to completely scare me. So, um, so this was saying, but it, it does rely on getting your stakes down at the right time and, and getting them up at the right time um, and getting some bits and pieces of terrain scattered around. Um, and, and each time you're looking at those groups of four longbowmen or three longbowmen and a crossbowmen to put out enough firepower that it does blunt anybody else's attack and it, it does scare off anybody else's mounted. And, you know, in, in this period or in this small period, you get the stakes down the the french are a bit stuck to to be honest so it's, it's a much more sort of textbook typical one but but that's that's kind of how it works so I don't know, what what are your thoughts look you know it, it's trying to be historical but i still sit here scratching my head thinking is it usable <laughs> i think there's a couple of other comments to add yeah. one particularly commands two and three you've got the choice of either grouping the archers or you could actually use them as a kind of early um, renaissance heavy foot with with two firing wings mm. um, which i think there's some evidence that the english deployed like that um, mixing the crossbowmen in is particularly effective because if you are facing enemy foot knights 
there's still only protection of one against the crossbow. Yeah, and you let the crossbowman take the lead on shooting. And, exactly. Uh, and with with then the the longbowman in in support, so that that means even even the foot knights aren't completely safe if you can concentrate your your fire on them at, because it does take them time to to grind forward. So yeah, and, and moving them in little groups too, they've got they have that ability to to manage who they're shooting at quite quite easily. Yes, you know the disadvantage is as soon as the bowmen aren't in a group you're spending more points to deploy the stakes yeah so that's what you've got to weigh up and i think that's so it'll depend upon your opponent whether you want to keep whether you think you're very likely to use the stakes because you may end up never deploying the stakes mm. it's a threat. i think the re the thing that really neutralizes elite longbow is light infantry and i think what you find in this period is i mean there are a few armies like albanians or whatever but so many armies, people only take two or three light foot. Yeah. And if, if an elite longbow is firing at any heavy troops, it, it's amazing the factors. You know, you're shooting at spearmen on a on a zero, but you're elite. So you know, you can you can very quickly pile on the pressure on an opponent. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. You know, and again, particularly if we're looking in this mini period. You, you look down that French list and um, and there's two light infantry. That's it. That's all they're allowed. So yes. those two light infantry are going to struggle to stand in front of, um, well, whatever this is, um, 10 long bowmen and two crossbowmen, aren't they? They're, they're going to have to be dodging, doing a bit of dodgeball left, right and centre to catch all those arrows before exactly. it hits their heavy foot. And if they dismount, then they're slower and the longbow can just back up out of the way. Yeah. Dave, what's what's your thought? I think you're you're going to be defend you're going to go for a defending in forest here, aren't you? Yeah, no. Just, just, well, I'm not sure. But probably not forest actually. Um, I think plains just gives you much more opportunity of fields because yes. once you get into forests and plantations, you're taking minus one for shooting out of them, sure. which yeah, yeah, which isn't yeah. as good. So you really want you know your brush, your scrub, your fields to yeah. um to get these long bowmen just marching through and making it very obvious where other people have got to funnel stuff stuff through and perhaps you're not even opposing it in a way in the army you know you need to cut down the amount of terrain as possible yeah, yeah. and you know forest and and then I, I if if you were going forest i would then try and sneak the two elite light foot javelin in just to sort of give you some sort of terrain troops but that's my feel on that yeah um, but i wonder if you know if you're trying to do that you're trying to to get around the flanks of a of a different army and break it up and actually you want yeah. people to think oh sod it i'll have a go at the longbowmen um yeah. in a way um you you want to make them look vulnerable in some ways having the um the crossbowmen in that group of four um and having one without the stakes who's not elite makes them perhaps look vulnerable enough to try and have a go at um in, in some yeah. strange way i think the other comment that's in rich richard's comment about if you have two archers together and they can maneuver themselves so they're picking on one target rather what you want is you don't want a row of archers all shooting at their own individual target what you want is two archers ganging up together and fire so if you've got a knight in the open and you can get two longbowmen shooting at him you've got plus one shooting mounted plus one for a mate and you're a longbow, you're going to knock that knight down very, very quickly. And then when that knight comes in, um, it's all, you, you actually get into a point where it's an evens fight. Yeah, and, and I guess that's the um, that's sort of the micro version of the that sweeping arc of of longbowmen that the the French so obligingly charged into so many times, as well. And, you know, I mean, moving them around, in, you know, you've got there's two options with bowmen, longbowmen, whichever bowmen gang them up in a big group where they should kick out a lot of shooting or split them up into penny packets where two of them operate together. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a really good trick. Yeah, there's, there's some more options with it, for sure. Okay, then, well, look, that's um, that's three of the English. Let's, um, let's move on and have a look at the French. This means war. Okay, well, look, we covered the English. Um, always best to do the winners first, I guess. Oh, no, no, I suppose by the end of it, they weren't the winners, were they? Um, 
but both sides get to win what a great what a great campaign but let's look at the french which on the paper you know on the surface of it as an army with a lot more options to it it doesn't um draw your eye to you're supposed to be using longbow um and, and it's got some very good quality mounted units um but it's it's thinking about fighting an opponent who's optimized to deal with that which does present kind of a an unusual challenge in um in drawing up a list but dave let's have a look at yours um first you've got a 1429 list with um i can see you've actually put some proper generals in you've even gone proper full-on strategist um joan of arc i imagine uh, yep yep there she is and you've got a 13 a five and a um a teeny tiny four there um in your um 22 unit initiative two 14 29 hundred years war french army so you know did you enjoy doing this one more was there more toys to choose from did you um so that do you feel it's a better list or is it still as hamstrung as as some of the others well this one this one actually took to a competition we had a one day competition in central london Okay. And I, I designed it because I thought I want to use John Dark. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually played um, uh, Tommy from Ireland in the competition in Eve Bought Footnights, which I kind of dismissed in the past. And mm. I thought, right, I want to copy that and have a go with it. So I came up with this list in that sort of instance, and um, it came a cropper as soon as it got in. Right. <laughs> in fact, okay. it's four, five mounted foot. Uh, mounted knights ran straight over my foot knights which was a bit of a shock mm. um, but i thought i'd found some tricks for that so it, it, against the mounted it wasn't good but i think it's a fun army i think it's fairly ac it's fairly accurate for the historical period and things is it, is it kind of been designed thinking about the english army as an opponent in mind is there a bit of that or is it just a more generic um, one it's trying to be sort of generic and but I mean, the, the one thing i i mean i was actually trying to think about fighting mounted Okay, but that didn't work at all. In right. the first command, you see, there's a light artillery, and my idea was the light artillery sits in the line with the foot knights, and any knights that come close, you go up and try and shoot them down. But that just didn't work at all. Light artillery didn't work at all. Work. Well, look, run, run us through. Talk us through what's in each command line by line, then, and then we'll we'll have a look at it. Sure. I mean, so the third core, the core three, is two heavy cavalry impacts and two crossbowmen mediocre that's that's a you know the standard micro command that can go down first to try and get a look at where the opponents are or it can go into an ambush or it can go into a flank march or it can you know do one of the above to try and make the enemy think what's going on um again because i've got a strategist i've got three opportunities for an ambush you know you, you want to put all three ambushes down to sort of make your opponent think about what's going on and that you know yeah. the idea is to make the, make the enemy put the enemy on the sort of uh, back foot as much as you can um okay the second command is to hold the flank as much as anything because you've got some uh crossbowmen there you've got a couple of knights on foot and you've got a heavy knight impact which, as Richard said in the last comment, we have, you can sit him behind the line just to threaten, keep, you know, you know, to be able to pull out and, you know, fill a hole or, or spring out from behind and use its mm. more maneuverability. To, yeah, you know. so, so, two, so two knights on foot are solid. Um, two crossbowmen yeah. gives you decent shooting and the heavy knight either makes it five wide and it's, that's, yeah. you've got paper, scissors and stone in there. None of them are, are massive, but there's just a little bit of everything, isn't there? Exactly. And the crossbowman with the Pavese is going to be doing the shooting with the mediocre guy helping him. And the knight is there to almost protect, can, he can operate to protect the crossbowman if he can as well. Then you've got the main um, force with Jean Dark is a strategist. And the, the idea of this was that she's going to be using her strategy points to try and rally up troops in combat. You know, that was the, the thinking behind this. Um, you've got a couple of levies sit behind the line to plug holes. You've got two crossbowmen, again, to sit on a flank. Again, one with a pavise, he's fairly bulletproof, with a mediocre friend to help him with shooting. And then it's the foot knights that are going to do the fighting, along with a heavy swordsman, two-handed weapon. You've got a light foot to protect things and add shooting somewhere. 
and I've never used a light artillery so the idea was to try and see what that did and it didn't do very much didn't at do all. much so yeah five five foot knights two of them elite is pretty solid and then adding another couple of heavy swordsmen with two-handed weapon gives you you know a seven combat frontage of two-handed weapons which I think Richard your um your spear heavy English army is not going to be massively happy about that I'd imagine <laughs> but, um, no I mean to me this army is going to be brilliant against any foot army and probably most cavalry armies but it, its weakness is it doesn't have much of a response to mounted knights because it doesn't really have the firepower to stop them and it doesn't have the spearmen or the pikemen to hold them off. Um, and as Dave said, that's, that's, that's its Achilles heel. But other than that, it's got a lot going for it and no army, no army is great against everyone. So. <laughs> I, I completely yeah, I with that i mean the, my idea was with the first command is that you normally face enemies with four elite knights you know that's the usual sort of command so i was thinking right okay i'm at least six or seven wide and i'm trying to negate his ability his his impact ability by having a bit more width and if he does break through i'll try and plug the hole with levy and also, I was also trying to think, I'll almost sacrifice the light artillery in the line to a knight to try and beat the other knights coming through. So, but it, yeah, it, you, that... um, <laughs> but paying or eking out somewhere the extra four points to make that light tune into a heavy could um, could make quite a difference. Because I find heavy, um, you you do still shoot quite a long way, and and there's such a big psychological you know, barrier yeah. for other people. But but is this an army that goes forwards um, too much to you know really use that? Um, I don't know. Initiative two. Are, are you thinking about moving this forwards or? Yeah, the, the light artillery shoots at four. Yeah. So you're trying to sort of get one shot in popper a knight to give your foot knights a bit more of an advantage. That that was the that was the the idea. Theory. And as I say, you know, you're almost going to sacrifice that light artillery to a knight. All right, it will go straight through and pop out the other side. But you're going to, you know, try and hold it. It, it, it. I'm just trying to give my foot knights more ability to win against the mounted. Was was the theory about yeah. that? And then if yeah. I'm fighting another foot knight army, I, I think I'm I'm pretty damn strong. Yeah, quite possibly. No, well, certainly against another foot knight army, you'd be very strong. Richard, what's what's your thoughts on that one? No, I I think as I've said, I mean it. It's it's got quite a long line, um, you know. There's a nice mix. The heavy cavalry impact isn't that great head-on against knights, but against a lot of other things, it'll give them a hard time. It's a nice little flank march command. But as I say, in, in even in a medieval period where you might face a lot of medium or or heavy knights, I I would worry about its ability to to stop you know e even even a few um yeah i mean i think but in this late later version you can't have any spearmen um and but i think at the end of the day you know that so if you're facing a mounted knight army you just have to deploy very defensively and put yeah. down the terrain <laughs> and put down the terrain yeah 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 just hide Okay, all right, interesting one. Well, let's um, let's flick on and have a look at the next one. This means war. This means war. So, Richard, this is your um, French army. You've you've picked another reasonably early date. You've gone before that sort of 1400 option which um means i'm th 1367 so as i'm looking at this i'm probably looking for those spears um and yep there they are you've also got 22 um your initiatives are a stellar one here that you've achieved through two competent <laughs> generals spread out in your your 10 um your um it says four but i think it might be five because there's five troops in it um that might be an error on the spreadsheet and an eight which possibly means it's 23 um, yes. if, if those maths are correct and um, 23 not 22 um, weird spreadsheet error there but um, so talk us through 
through this and how you put this together and what how you see this fighting? So this is an army kind of designed for an imperial battle against the English. Um, the thing I like about the Pavese is that it comes into effect after the normal missile adjustment. So it gives your heavy spearmen a protection of one against longbow and two against crossbow, um, which means that it really toughens you up against their shooting or if you were facing Huns or Mongols or somebody against mounted shooting. Um, it's got enough foot knights with them to be able to inflict pain on the enemy. So, and, and then enough shooting to stop somebody just hanging around in front of you being annoying. So I think the, the idea, you know, you'd put command two in the center, that's five heavy foot, um, depending on where the rough terrain fell, commands one and three would either put their heavy foot next to it or their shooting next to it. Uh, if, if, if it was one massive line of heavy foot, then the three crossbow on, on each end would be there to hold off enemy mounted or to lap round and bring fire to bear to shoot in the long line of, of heavy foot. Yeah, because you've got, you've got 11, is it 11 heavy foot there? You've got five in that central command, three knights on yeah. foot, two heavy spearmen. And then it looks like two knights on foot and a heavy spearman, again, all with pavies in, in either flank command. So yes. that's that's quite a big frontage, isn't it, that, of, um, of quite tough old stuff? It is. And you've got the two heavy knights on the flanks, which can either extend that line or be a flank or hold for breakthroughs. And then you know you've got four troops in each flank um, or five in in the first command able to go in the genoese elite crossbowman is also quite nice for for softening up heavy foot knights or or you know is quite intimidating to enemy mounted knights uh, again that pavise just means if you're facing longbow that they're, they're not complete fodder um so so that was really the, the concept of it. And I think, uh, you know, I think there's only one light infantry. So actually, as you say, just correct the spreadsheet error. And, uh, and um, it's I think there's 23 units of which 22 can go in the battle line. So that's, I think that's quite tasty. Yeah, that, that's almost kind of a, you know, as you say, it matches up against the English because well, you've got a central that's that's all combat troops, that five, but but the other ones are kind of three heavy foot who go in and fight and three shooting troops, crossbow, crossbow police, crossbow police elite. So you you are using those um, all arms formations of three shooters, three combat infantry, and then a heavy night impact as kind of a reserve or a... Um, having a second go at paper, scissors, stone, depending yep. on what you're fighting um, as well. Um, and you've still got quite a lot of the French nobility there. You, you've got the four, five, well, you actually got seven of them as well. So you're, you are using the French nobility, but by this time they've clearly learned to get off their horses um, and and start marching towards the sounds of the longbows. Now, Dave, what's, um, what's your thoughts looking at this one? Um, I like the idea of the crossbow pavise elite i think that's you know that's a really interesting troop type um i think those crossbow working together are going to be quite powerful you know, you know the only danger is the mediocre guy but you've just got to keep him out of the way he's just going to there to add on the shooting and i do also like the having one mounted knight working behind the line or just as a, as a reserve is a very good thing to so i, I think it's very balanced and, and you know, you've, you've got 23 bases and we've actually this time managed to have two generals who are not completely included and things like that. So really, really competent. this is going to have a little bit of advantage on some things. Um, although other things may just grind straight through the centre, but it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Interesting. This means war. All right, well, look, let's, um, let's flick on and, and look at the third one then. 
100 Years War French. I've gone a bit later, still 1399. Um, and, and again, you know, this, this awesome initiative of one um, achieved by cobbling together a couple of competent generals. But, but this is this is picking up the coin and, and flicking it over. And, and I think, Richard, where you've got heads, um, I'm going tails with this one. Um, and this is just saying, actually, sometimes with these, these armies, when you get, um, you know, when you look down the list and you get a, a gift of 12 of the best knights possible, um, that's a way to use it. And um, uh, having a lot of knights, having that many, all elite, if you so wish, knights in an army is such a, a rare thing that there is a strategy of saying, do what the French did and um, and go big on on what the army list is just very good at and um, you know it's it's a great um, army for socialising in the bar uh, because you're going to maximise the, the the red wine drinking time um, or, or the cider depending if you're from parts of Normandy or something like that but this is yeah it's literally looking at it going they're good at that let's just double down on that really so it's a twenty um, a six a nine and a five. So you know, the the two smaller commands are are pretty straightforward. You've got four impetuous heavy knights, elite, a couple of light tree crossbow to to screen them possibly, um, and an ordinary included unreliable general. But that's four impetuous elite knights, and you're going to have to deal with that. Um, it it becomes not my problem quite quickly. The the other one is a um, a more sophisticated version of that. Um, barely more sophisticated. It's two um, impetuous heavy knights elite, couple of uh, sorry, one valet, which is the heavy cavalry impact. So, so the two knights can scare a lot of people off, but that that heavy cavalry is okay. But it gives you an extra thing. It can get around a flank, and a couple of light infantry javelin elite, the B days, who can who can either screen or, as we've said before, in this kind of mini theme, they're still pretty good in rough terrain. You know. It, the two of them are going to have a staring match with them um, with your mediocre swordsman i think at some point um, and then the um, the monstrous um competent general nine strong um uh, central command and i say central but it's still pretty similar um you know i'm taking three elite impetuous knights and two more non-impetuous knights that's just a points thing but um i've included the general so across the army, you've got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You've got 11 of the 12 um, impetuous knights, which you're just hurling at someone. Um, this is a block of five. The textbook for, for all of us, the crossbowman mediocre and the, the elite crossbowman pervice operating to, to shoot them in and give them a little bit of extra support. Um, the two um, mediocre swordsmen um, who lurk lurk in the rough terrain um, possibly ganging up with the um, the light tree javelin as well but but they're sort of padding because this is just all about picking a place to put 12 impetuous heavy knights um, of which sorry 11 impetuous heavy knights nine of which are elite um, two of which have got included generals and are rolling the dice and and overwhelming people and um, as long as the army bears, bears um, very careful attention to the weather forecast and um, has a as an awareness of the impact of rough terrain on mounted troops attacking longbowmen with stakes. Um, it's it's going to be doing what it does, and um, you're stack. You know, you are sort of committing it to the dice, but you're stacking up the odds pretty much as well as you can with with all those elites and all those embedded generals. Yeah, I think certainly it's going to be a fun army to play, and um, yeah, get, getting your deployment right. Because the thing about those kind of armies is they're very hard to redeploy. But I think you just have to make a plan. And e even if the odds don't favour you, stick to your plan, charge in and hope that the elite and all the heavy armour and so on win you the day. Um, as you say, it's hard to argue with. It's um, And it moves fast enough and strikes hard enough that even if an enemy overlaps you on the flanks, that they may not have long enough to actually hurt you. You may have broken through by the time they're in a position to exploit that. 
Yeah, I think you know this would have a go at even even at the center of most of these armies. Um, you know, I, I think even going back all the way to the the first one with the um, the Low Countries, those five those four mediocre spearmen are, are probably the thing that they shy away. From. Sorry, mediocre pikemen. It's probably what they'd shy away from. But most of the rest of the stuff, because of the heavy armor, well, because the heavy armor and because they're all impetuous so you've actually got no choice so you might as well rationalize to yourself that it's a sensible option um you you just charge at it anyway <laughs> and give it a go and um a roll the dice and this is this feels like the you know the flower of french nobility this is this is the way to do the army and um and hope that they just get a better weather forecast than they did um in the the three historical battles to see if they get a different outcome dave yeah. what do you think of it um, I think it, it 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 just does what it says on the tin. It's a French knight army. Um, I played a game, a medieval game last night with Simon Ray Mayer. He took feudal English. I think he had nine knights in total, but you've got more here. And, you know, if you put command one and command two together, where you've got four, seven, nine knights rolling down the table, that's going to be more than anything can really withstand as long as in the open you've got enough medium foot to sit and occupy the wings enough to give enough time for the knights to do their thing and hopefully win you the game um you may have to mark a piece of terrain at some point with a knight or two you know if, if you've got a piece of terrain which is problematic what you're going to have to do is keep a knight just outside your shooting distance but prevent any opponent's troops coming out of that terrain whilst yeah. you shoot into it with your crossbowmen, just to occupy that whilst the rest of it. Um, you, you're going to fight in planes, I assume, and uh, just take a, a tiny little field and a road. Yeah, no, you, you want this kind of, you know, pretty bald or possibly one lump of terrain. So you don't want the enemy to be able to squirt out the way completely. Yeah. You want to, to have a, a good idea, but you also want to stretch their, their heavy infantry line a little bit so that, that you can start to force yourself into fighting against their mounted and, and their knights so very simple um i wouldn't say idiot proof because i'm sure i could have a go at um disproving that theory but um it, it does what it does it says on the tin There's what really messes up this kind of army is if the opponent manages to get a large piece of terrain roughly in the center so that the yeah. knights have to charge past it and that you yeah. can fre threaten the flanks of a group of four or five knights as they go past you know it, you can't stop 11 knights but if the enemy can use terrain to break you up into smaller packets yeah. that that's when you get into trouble with this kind of army yeah and no, i've i've struggled with that um i think using my hungarians online um recently as well and i think i somebody had a swiss ally and they um the that group of halberdiers sat in terrain right down the middle um I think back in DBM days, it used to be called a bow motorway, didn't it? Um, that extended straight down the middle of the table that your bowmen would just march down. But you know, I suppose here, having having thought about that and learning it, you're probably just feeding that terrain, um, the two mediocre swordsmen and and the two crossbowmen to an extent, and and kind of expecting that they're going to lose. But if if they occupy and stop stuff leaping out of the yes. terrain um the knights are past it and, yes. and you've just got to accept those those three four units as attrition and hope that the rest of the army doesn't concede 20 <laughs> hits before it rolls <laughs> over something <laughs> and, uh, you know the clock is ticking on it and, and that's what it's got to do i think when we began playing we were all going with heavy knight armies and we kind of dismissed them uh, over time because we sort of realized that there's a lot more subtlety to the game than we thought and then I remember Dan took to the world an incredibly large French impetuous knight army and did very, very well with it. And you have to really sort of examine it again after that sort of thing. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's different papers of stone. I think it, if you've got into a habit of expecting everybody to turn up with clever, you know, combined arms armies, and then someone does turn up with a, a one dimensional thing. Um, again, you know, talk at the first time we all went to um, Chalois um for the worlds and um i had a horrendous time against a an italian lad with um with that scots army and which i'd yeah. never seen before that had 15 mediocre pikemen that it just threw at me and i couldn't deal with that at all <laughs> it was like 
why didn't why didn't we all thought of these one dimensional armies? We're all trying to be clever. Um, so I think there is that element of surprise. And and actually, I'm, I'm slightly sort of surprised. There's so many different ways of of pulling these two lists together. I think you with the English, you get drawn to the long because That's the iconic thing. And I think with the French, you get drawn to the knights because that's the iconic thing. But but as we said at the start, there's a lot of earlier, smaller battles and chevauche was it you know the the big mounted raids and and things which went on outside the three battles in 100 years and these lists are actually quite good for simulating those on a on a pretty small scale really you know the the, the scalability of the rule set means that some of these small bands of 20 40 knights and a couple of hundred spearmen and some crossbowmen and you you can be recreating that as much as you can be recreating Cressy, Poitiers, um, you know, the big, the big three battles. So it's, it's kind of been an interesting exercise, actually. As, um, as always, I think it shows that every list, if you focus on one list at a time, it's amazing what you find. Yeah, <laughs> very much so, very much so. Well, look, let's, um, let's move on and, and have a look at some of the figures. This means war. Well, look, we've covered six army lists there, three of each, and um, possibly found something quite decent for it. The the way that we normally wrap these up is to to have a quick chat of the um, about the figures for it. And um, I don't know, are these armies that that you guys have collected? Uh, is it one we, we talked about it as being a classic list? I, I think I've sort of collected it, but as part of a more generic medieval um, piece. But um, are, are these armies that you own? A bit, a bit the same. I, I've got a whole mix of late medieval figures that I sometimes use as these armies, but I've also used as German and condottieri. I've got a lot of um, longbow from a Fog AM army. Uh, in, in Fog, the uh, Hundred Years War English was quite good. You could use the longbowmen as a sort of like miniature. Um, Sherman tank running around in boots of fours or sixes or something. So yeah. I've got a whole drawer full of um, longbowmen. So I've got the longbowmen and I built up a Donington army from having Donington's longbow, very, very pretty. And yeah, they, they produced that. That's one of their first new era ranges, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, they were very, very good with the padded uh, jackets and the things. So I really like them. So my, my basic medievals are all Donington. Uh, they do a they do a very nice French knights dying. Right. I think they also do a, a, a Joan of Arc figure. Although um... I've, I've got the Joan of Arc figure. That's yeah. one of the intrigue with the ba the banner. And it, yeah, um, Damien's banners are very very nice. I really like his banners. His banner sheets are researched. They give you all the sort of explanation. They explain who's who in the army. So I've got okay. the Jean d'Arc banner and I've got a Jean d'Arc figure. Because that, you know, I, I actually built the, the list we did in this with the, I mean, I thought I've never used a foot knight army. Hmm. Let's have John Dark as a strategist. Let's put some artillery. Let's put some really strange toys into it and see where we get to. And yeah. I really, Are the, um, you know, is it fair to say that the, the mounted and the, the foot knights here are or, sh or should be noticeably different from generic late medieval knights and um and dismounts or, or is it once they get dismounted they they look all pretty much the same all the way up to the end of the period in um in 15 mil with black undercoat and some dry brush I, I think unfair? it depends how much of a purist you are yeah. in that if you are a purist the Poitiers Crassy era the mid 14th century have the heraldic um Dupons you know which are the they're the tight-fitting um, heraldry oh, okay. over, their, over their armour rather than the looser 13th century um, surcoats. Whereas as you move into the 15th century, everybody just tends to be in bare metal. Right, okay. And, and so it's much easier in the 15th century, you know, anybody, you can be anything, but really, you know, if you're doing Poitiers or Cresset, you should paint up all the heraldry on, on actually on okay. the figures but in terms of figures though it's it's the difference between 
flowing robes but these should be much more the heraldry should be painted almost straight onto the the figure's chest if you like it was it was just tight it, it, stuff. exactly it's just a tight a tight surcoat actually that actually fits over the armor and the difference as well is in the 14th century you tend to have more of the pointed bassinet with the raisable visor whereas as you go into the 15th century you get more of the salet type with the single sort of right. Cylon Raider slit. You have a light behind it going backwards and forwards or something like that. Like Kit from Knight Rider or something. Yeah. 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 No, I think I think I've got that quite a lot of those Donington figures and they've got a lot of a lot of different variety in it. I think that's the ones where the um the mounted figures come with separate lances and they have a little plate that slides down the lance to be yeah. the the kind of the, the man brace yeah yeah the man brace that, that comes as a separate one but then then i also mix in a load of the really quite nice sort of museum dismounted knights and and things like that um, yes is it is it reasonable with this one because i think again i've got some long bowmen who are um they're old glories um old glory's got kind of a sub brand for their medieval stuff um i i can't remember what it's called is it called Battle Honours or something? There's a sort of 15 mil sub brand that's not normal old glory. Um, that I've got some, but they're in the heraldry, they don't have those ribbed, padded um tops. And and looking at the 25 mil figures, where I guess it's very hard to look past the Perry box set of plastics, they do that medieval, late medieval archers and um mercenaries as a set. And longbowmen for the war of the roses but then they also do a separate one for the hundred years war with all the the ribbed um kind of puffer puffer jacket um stuff <laughs> um was that that sort of puffer puffer jacket thing for this whole period or would they have gone towards the more um you know heraldry one side red one side blue that that sort of um thing over the top of it by the end of this period do we well, that that really is getting into the 1450s and the war of the roses right with, with the with the livery on it um and just a straight sort of quilted acaton is more 14th century what you tend to see as you go through time is that the long bowmen start wearing more armor so there's quite a lot of images with people as they as they capture stuff off the french right, the long okay. bowmen start wearing it so you see okay. them in in uh, in male jackets, in male hoods, in even plate armor on their legs. Um, wow! You know, as long as the, okay. as long as the body can move. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And, and you know, so what? One of the tricky things again, they're already expensive. So why would you make them armored? But when you look at some of the pictures, um, you know, these guys are what would qualify as a as a medium knight in yeah. terms of the <laughs> kit they're wearing yeah. yeah well maybe that's you know maybe that's the question was we all sit here and speculate at this the time we're recording this we're probably a, a few months away from seeing version four um i wonder if there's a theory that that there's a scope to do long bowmen slightly differently because there's there's always that question about should they have melee capability or or should they have armor or, or does that just stop them working because they're too expensive Are, is there any tweaks that would make longbowmen work more like longbowmen uh, i think it's fairly good as as it is um the they clearly weren't hand-to-hand -hand experts no. the way janissaries were yeah but clearly they were perfectly happy once the knights were knocked over to go up and stick a sword in their in in their visor yeah. or to capture them yeah um and i think simply by being elite they you know if you put a, an elite longbowman in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the medium swordsman they will win 40 percent of the time yeah Especially so if they damage the other guy on the way in, <laughs> and if they damage the guy on the way in, they will win sixty percent of the time. Yeah. yeah, well, maybe maybe it's then um, it's just that inability to actually charge opponents. Maybe they um, well, no, can bowmen charge damaged opponents though? I'm trying to remember the rules here. I think they can. Um, they certainly can in the flank. I, I'm yeah, not sure about yeah. frontally. They, yeah, they can maybe. charge other bowmen who are disordered frontally. Right or something okay. but it's also they can also charge 
if the enemy is an overlap. So one of the tricky yeah. things by having the medium swordsman, even if it's mediocre, you put him in and then all your bowmen can go in. <laughs> Just <laughs> can pile in as well to support him. Okay, so that does work in that combined arms thing then. All right. And then um, then I guess the other one uh, in terms of figures, there's obviously the um, the new plastic um, version of the um, Corvus Belli range, which is, it's kind of a cute range. They've got, um, they're nice figures, but with that, wash of cuteness that um maybe the donnington ones are a bit more you know really person real personally uh, but there's a there's a cute dimension to the corvus belli ones and um, in fact i think somewhere i think i've um i've cooked up a list using that um that specific um box set to see if there's something there that um that can be done out of it i'll see if i can why don't you look for can, those i see if I I throw that on screen, yeah yeah, who else? Plug in for Essex because okay. I think this is this is one of the periods where I really like their figures. You know, particularly yeah. you perhaps don't necessarily need all all the animation for a heavy yeah. knight on a horse. True, uh, and I, I have a lot lot of theirs, and yeah, they they are a bit vanilla, but I think I I really I really like them for this period. Yeah, well, I, I, th I think I agree with that. I think the Essex, I, I did an Essex uh, Hussite army with Essex and the foot knights, even the mounted knights, they can be a bit splayed out with their arms out wide and things and, and the lances can be a bit chunky. But I think the foot knights are really nice. And uh, I think a lot of this is, is about painting, certainly on the longbow side of it, is about getting a good sort of two tone, you know, dark and light sort of stripes to paint the vertical ribbed jackets and, and getting that effect but i think essex essex their bowmen do have quite a mix of people who start to have some of the armor as well so you can get yes. get some good mix in from the bowmen and, and you're cramming quite a few on a base i guess with with adlg where you're doing square bases as well 40 by 40 you get away from having to have two exact ranks as well yes which if you're you know you you can put them in a a mass behind some stakes or something and, and space them all irregularly and and those Essex ones are quite quite slim so when yep. they're they're in their firing position you you can fit them staggered at quite a lot of different ways on the bases next to each other and and get that real sense of a massive bowman I, th I think you could probably fit 10 I guess if you really wanted to to go for it and create a, the impression of a real solid line of of people there with those Essex figures um, I think having them offset really makes yeah. them look much much more realistic yeah i really like yeah. that it's one of the things i love about adlg really yeah, yeah just... eagles, you know it's so good to put in loads and loads of uh banners as well mm. you know, a medieval army would have a lot of banners and that can make an army look really pretty yeah because i think the um here we go here's, here's the list i found so the um that corvus belli set according to what's on the the psc website it's it's pretty heavily geared to, to a different rule set, obviously. But, and that means there's an awful lot of longbowmen um, and an awful lot of, um, of foot sort of halberdiery billmen. Um, and it's, it's a bit difficult to see from the description what exactly you've actually got there um, because the troop types don't kind of match. And there's almost no mounted. And I think we've all thought, you know, you do need the light infantry or the, the two hobelars to give you a bit of paper scissors stone or possibly the couple of the knights or something but so this is this is but this is literally for i think it used to be 35 quid it's now gone up to 40 quid their their box set um not a great list but it is 40 quid um which is about i think it'd be about 52 if you bought it from from essex or something so it's only about a tenner difference um but so this would be a command you can cobble together and you've got stick the strategist in that's partly just to get the points up because <laughs> you sort of need need to do it um two foot knights um a halberdier and four longbowmen in your first shooting and mixed um mixed command um a foot knight well sorry two foot knights a halberdier and three longbowmen in in your next command with a, a competent included general and then two spearmen who could be billmen i guess um with armor and a couple of longbowmen so you're using 11 longbowmen there um is it 11 no sorry um four five six seven eight nine longbowmen because i think there's nearly 54 in the packet 
um, or officially to do it, which it's not a great list. Um, I think you'd probably end up spending the 25% discount on metal figures on, on extra figures to make it into a proper list anyway. Um, and you'd get some wastage on, on the longbowmen and, and possibly the halberdiers, but there's, there's something there. Um, and I think again, you know, it's got way too much command just to soak up points because there's just not, not quite 200 points there, but this was more an exercise in perhaps, perhaps give the longbowmen, um, perhaps give the longbowmen stakes and drop some of the command points there. If you were, if you only had this set of figures to play with, um, I don't know how, how bad a list is this, really, if you guys are looking at it? it I mean, it's, it's pretty weak because it's only 17. Yeah. I, I like the Corvus Belly figures. Yeah. I remember looking them years ago for my medievals. And the, the Halberdier is a really nice figure, as are the Longbowmen. Um, as you say, they're only the only weakness is you don't have quite enough of the range to bring in the light foot and some other yeah. bits of pieces. The Knights sort of look a bit odd, I think, um, yeah. from what I remember. But I, I, the halberdiers, I really like them. Yeah, I suppose it's fight, you know, it's finding troops that, that, if you really want to go for the same style, troops that that match that slightly cartoonish style. But you know, there's there's the bones of a list there. But um, but because there's not quite there's too many longbowmen probably in the packet for us, and um, and then you end up needing to buy extras anyway. So so that pricing difference isn't quite as much as it is. But but it's an interesting option if anybody wants to to kick off and get started with this one, um, I guess. And the army. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, a, and a good start on the army. This means war. This means war. Okay, well, I think that's rattled through all of those then. And, um, yeah. you know, I think, Richard, you, you said earlier, the more you stare at a list, the better it is, or the better chance you have of actually finding something half decent in it. And I think we all probably started this one thinking these are all a bit rubbish. Um, I'm not sure if we managed to convince ourselves that that we might think about using some of these yet. Um, but the French one, are... I would. I mean, I, I've seen Hubert use them a lot, and yeah. uh, I've found it very hard. I mean, I find it hard to beat him anyway. But he, yeah. he plays the French a lot both mounted and dismounted and um he he's really got some good ideas on on how to use them um the english um i just think the the war of the roses version yeah tends to be better yeah um yeah you don't get the german ally but but you get some cheaper versions of the troops and and you you just get you know I, I just feel happier, I think, looking at that. Yeah. And if you're going with Perry, I think it's easier to do the figures and morph them to other things. So yeah, they fit I would be more completely. tempted to go to do a to do a fourteen fifty army rather than a fourteen fifteen army. Yeah, I'd I th definitely I think... do that Joan of Arc army again. I think that's yeah. quite. There's something in that army as long as you don't get ridden down by mounted knights. Yeah, <laughs> and I, and I think with the Perry stuff, the way I'd um, I'd approach it is. I'd just use the Wars of the Roses longbowmen anyway and um, plop yes. them on table for this and hope that no one notices or complains. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's like... most, pe most of the people we play yeah. don't have enough history yeah. to, to, to know those finer points. Well, well to and be I, honest, neither, neither did I before we started this conversation. So yeah, um, I think I, that's, I certainly that's don't important. Care. No, no, I exactly. certainly don't care. Yeah. I mean, if, some, if somebody uses something completely outrageous, yeah. I get a bit sniffy. Yeah, but having you two know, different like using sets. An elephant to be a knight, but a yeah, bit exactly. other than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but having two different sets of longbowmen for for because they wore their jackets in a slightly different way, fifty years apart, is um is probably going a step too far, even for for our extensive and aggressive purchasing campaign. Yes. Yes, indeed. And on that note, um, we will we will love you all and leave you. So goodbye from all of us. Thank you. Bye.